Uh, the, the title of the talk, WGRF and Transition, I, you could probably say that about any organization. I think other presentations that have been for, before me have talked about the transition, but there are some specific things we're doing to change, and I thought uh, you'd be interested in hearing what those are all about today. So I will tell you a little bit about who we are and what we do and then how we're changing is how I'll finish this off. What we do is we invest in crop research and uh, it's crop production research is what we focus on and really uh, our stakeholders are farmers. So we're looking at research that we can invest in to benefit Western Canadian farmers. The outputs that we usually see out of this research can be information that might come out of a research paper or through technology transfer or uh, quite often it's also in wheat and barley varieties because we're heavily invested in that area also. I think uh, farmers over time, you know, since the prairies have been settled and farmed, have been very rapid adopters of technology. So if you go back more than 100 years, Marquis wheat, you know, the first wheat variety that really changed things, it wasn't many years that, that came out and there was 20 million acres of it being grown. And, and if you just think even in the past few decades, whether it be, uh, whether it be direct seeding, uh, crop protection products, you can look at the rise of canola, and Ward will tell you the canola story next, uh, pulse crops. You can look at farm equipment, where we're going in the future with technology. Uh, when you look at other industries out there, uh, when farmers see an opportunity for a return on investment, you can see how quickly that technology is adopted and improved. And that's uh, really what we try and do at the front end of, uh, is uh, prime it through research. And, whether, and most of the research that we get involved in is through public institutions. So as far as an organization, uh, we are a farmer-directed organization. I'll tell you a little more about that. Our focus is on funding research. Uh, we're, we're not into marketing or policy in those areas, so you may not have heard, heard of us like you would of some other organizations. We do fund, uh, provide funding to about over 20 different crop types in Western Canada. Uh, we're interprovincial, so we do uh, focus on Western Canadian farmers from BC all the way to Manitoba. As you'll see though, we fund research in other areas when we see a benefit coming back to farmers here. We, uh, we look at cross-cutting, cross so whether it's uh, an integrated approach, we look at upstream pre-breeding type of research, breeding research, crop production research, a little bit of on the post-production side also. Uh, we're an independent organization uh, accountable to the 18 members that are part of our organization. We don't do our own uh, process for calling for proposals. We collaborate with other uh, processes that are out there. Uh, in Alberta you have the Ag Funding Consortium, uh, Genome Canada runs a process, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada runs some processes. So we, we look for other processes out there and work with those collaborators of interest that may want to co-fund with us and try and align in that regard. It does make us a fairly unique organization because of our scope and what we do. Uh, we just celebrated our 35th anniversary last year. And uh, so that was back in 1981 uh, when we did start. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you the list of organizations that got WGF started. Uh, it really came about, there was $9 million left over in a federal program, the pre-runner pre, pre, uh, to crop insurance. And the federal government was looking at how they could best use that. And this group of 12 farm organizations approached them and said, we'd like to create an endowment fund so we can use that to benefit farmers into the future with research. Then in the 90s, the uh, federal government approached WGRF to manage wheat and barley checkoffs for variety development. And then in the 2000s, the federal government uh, asked and named WGRF to receive any overages from the rail revenue entitlement uh, legislation that came into place. So sometimes the endowment fund, you might hear it called the, the rail revenue fund. It has a little more history than that to it. So this is a list of those 18, or sorry, the 12 organizations that were the original founders of WGRF. And uh, if you, I won't read the list, but if you can see it and you look through it, you'll see uh, you know, many of those have changed since then, of course, with, uh, with change in farm organizations and, and economics and the way agriculture has changed. 
But some of the keys here, it's a fairly diverse group, uh, some general farm organizations, some commodity organizations, but what really brought them together is they were all farmer-directed organizations. Uh, they had an interest in uh, providing some leadership to research funding, and uh, they're really a diverse, they created really a diverse group to look at this. If you uh, fast forward, there's been a lot of changes over time. This is a list of 18. I won't read it all. Hopefully, uh, you can see it. They are listed in the publication and on our website. It's maintained the principle of diversity. You'll see uh, there's crop commissions now. So there's more crop commissions and more, as more crop commissions have become established. There's also general farm organizations. There's some provincially based groups. There's some nationally based groups. There's, again, quite a diverse group. But the, uh, really the, the common theme that brings them together around the board table is that they believe in funding research to benefit Western Canadian crop producers. So I'll, I'll uh, spend pretty well the rest of my presentation telling you uh, really the story about research funding and what we do and where we're looking at going in the future. Uh, since 1981, we've invested uh, over $130 million into research. Uh, primarily through public institutions, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, the three Western Canadian agriculture universities in Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba have been the uh, main four recipients of the funding, although there's, there's many others that we have funded over time. The research that I'm going to talk about and the, uh, some of the examples of outcomes are pretty well all of it would be co-funded by many partners, whether it's uh, public institutions, whether it's producer commissions, sometimes some industry in kind or contribution also. Uh, I'm not listing all of those here, there'd be too many, and it varies a lot with project to project. I'm, uh, I'm telling the story from the WGF perspective, but keep in mind there's many funders that contribute to the success of the research. Uh, we have grown since 1981 to become the largest producer funder of crop research in Canada. Uh, last year was about $18 million, the year before was about $19 million. We currently have 250 active projects that we're funding uh, on over 20 crops. Oh, and I'll mention at the end of my presentation, we've just launched a new website and we've got all of those uh, current projects on there in a database, so I'd encourage you to check it out. Uh, it's really sort of phase one of that. We want to look for further improvements, so I'd love to hear from you about, on what you think about it too. Uh, as I mentioned, we like to look for collaborations on project funding wherever possible. Uh, some examples, I'll get into these a little more, that we, some of the bigger ones we focused on have been core wheat and barley breeding programs for over 20 years. Uh, Growing Forward 2 was mentioned in a previous presentation. We're involved in eight different uh, uh, programs under Growing Forward 2 co-funding. I've listed uh, about five of them here, the wheat, barley, agronomy, mustard, organic, as well as some others. And a new initiative that we're involved in is agronomy research capacity. We've seen a decline in that research capacity over the last decade or more, so we, are, we have been uh, paying some attention to that, and I'll tell you a little more about that. We have five different revenue sources. I, I won't refer to them too much after this, but uh, just so you under, understand the, the scope of what we deal with, or where we get our funds, uh, we have wheat checkoffs and barley checkoffs. They're uh, mandated to go into wheat and barley variety development. I'll mention more about that. I uh, mentioned the endowment <coughs> fund, so that's, that's an unrestricted fund that we can invest in whatever type of research we want. We do uh, receive royalties, about a million and a half a year from wheat and barley variety sales. And we do some third party uh, management of funds primarily through Growing Forward. So all of that contributes to uh, some of the uh, projects that I'm going to tell you about. This is uh, a stacked bar graph just to show you the approximately 20 year history of our annual funding expenditures. The uh, take home message here would be the growth since 2010 <coughs> on that. Uh, the blue would represent uh, the, the investment in wheat, so that's come from wheat checkoffs. The red is from barley, from barley checkoffs, and the green is from the endowment fund. And uh, we've, we've ramped up to a new level, and our target is to maintain this out till 2020 during our transition period that I'll explain to you. Uh, I'd like to talk about and give some examples of the research that we're involved in supporting. It's quite diverse. I'm just going to touch on a few examples, but again, I'd, I would encourage you to check out the website if you're, you'd like to see more about that. Uh, 
in the, in the top left-hand corner, this was the uh, announcement by Minister Ritz for the uh, wheat cluster. This was uh, made in Red Deer a few years ago. That's under Growing Forward too. So that's a $25 million program. I think many of you might be familiar with Growing Forward too, and there's been a number of uh, clusters, beef, pork, canola, wheat, barley, pulses. I, I, I'm going to miss a lot of them, but those are targeted funds to those crops. It's a national perspective, a number of funders, um, leveraged funds also from uh, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. Many of us are working quite hard now in anticipation of the next policy framework uh, that will come into place uh, April 1st, uh, 2018. So we're, we're trying to get ready for that and hoping for some positive news this summer after the minister's meeting. Uh, bottom right in this example of an infrastructure investment that we made at the University of Saskatchewan for their growth chambers. Uh, last year, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada wanted to look at the benefits to Canada for the investments that uh, not only ourselves, but public institutions and other crop commissions made into midge-tolerant wheat. So th this is one of the success stories they're profiling out of Growing Forward too. But you can see here over $450 million net benefit to the industry uh, after all the investments in midge-tolerant wheat are taken into account. And there's, uh, there actually is a, a study that was done on this. Uh, if you're curious about it, uh, let me know and I can get it to you. Uh, we've been funding Fusarium head blight research for over 15 years now. Uh, Fusarium head blight has been around since the 1800s in Europe, so it's not a new disease. And we're certainly not ahead of it here, as you'll be well aware, uh, in North America. It's something that we're continuing to invest in, and we will be into the future. But it really takes a coordinated effort from many funders and many researchers, and an integrated approach. I think we're going to see more efforts in this area under the next policy framework also. Uh, this is another project that we're uh, involved in co-funding. It was uh, through the Genome Canada call a few years ago. Uh, it's the Triticum Advancement Through Genomics uh, program. It's uh, led by Dr. Curtis Posniak out of the Crop Development Center at the University of Saskatchewan. And uh, it, it's really uh, been a flagship program that uh, Genome Canada it, it has been uh, actually very proud of. And uh, they see it as a success. And I, I think we're going to be successful in attracting additional funding through that. Uh, there, there's many institutions involved, but Curtis is the leader of this, and there was some really exciting news last year. Uh, the mapping of the wheat genome you might have heard about, so that was really the first in the world, and that was led uh, by Curtis out of the, out of the CDC, so we were, we were happy to be a part of that. And uh, many of you might know the wheat genome is much more complicated than the human genome, so it's uh, taken a, a while for scientists to get a handle on this, and this is really a foundational piece of work that uh, they uh, hope to build on. Another one that uh, we're quite interested in is the uh, Prairie Pest Monitoring Network. And there's a number of crop commissions along with ourselves that are funding this. And it, it's, it's uh, a good example of collaboration between uh, provincial and uh, federal uh, organizations. Uh, really, what, what they do during the growing season is put out weekly reports on, on crop pests and uh, what they anticipate happening and what is happening. And they, they have a website and they have an email list. And so they, they really try and make sure that agrologists are aware of this and, uh, and scientists and others. I think there's an opportunity for us to uh, do a better job of getting the message out. And uh, Twyla, you said you're going to ask me a question regarding extension and tech transfer. So I'll, I'll wait for that, but we're certainly uh, that hasn't been an area that, that we've been strong in or paid a lot of attention to, but I'll certainly look for some thoughts you might have in that area. And I put this one up just because it's an example. Um, this is Dr. DeRosa at Carleton University in Ottawa, and she's developed a, uh, a method for rapid detection of mycotoxins in grains. And we're funding, we funded phase one of her research, and now we're funding phase two. Uh, Hopefully the output will be is that they will develop a commercial arrangement and this will be available to uh, speed up that kind of testing. So uh, I, I put this in also because uh, just to uh, make the point that we don't just look at funding research in Western Canada. Uh, the main, our, our board really considers three criteria when they look at funding research. Uh, is it good science? Uh, is the researcher uh, 
likely to be able to do what they say they're, they're going to do? And third, and most importantly, is there a benefit to Western Canadian farmers? Mm -hmm. uh, we have a technical advisory committee that provides advice to the board that helps us make the, these decisions, but in the end, uh, we've funded some research in the U.S. and Eastern Canada, other areas, if we think there's an opportunity for the benefits to flow back to Western Canadian farmers. Uh, and here's another example, University of Lavelle. Um, this is again through Genome Canada, soybean research, but they're, they're involving Western Canadian researchers and some of the work they're doing in, uh, in soybeans leading, hopefully will lead to shorter season varieties which will provide a benefit here in Western Canada. This is one, uh, Dr. Hugh Becky out of Ag Canada in Saskatoon, uh, with funding from WGRF and others, was able to develop our rapid testing for uh, group two uh, tolerant weeds. So herbicide tolerance as you're aware is becoming a, a big issue and rapid testing for that is more important. So he, he's hopeful that this is actually uh, something that will be adopted by many areas in the world, the test that they've been able to develop. Because we fund research and it's important to bring bright uh, new young minds into research, uh, we've provided about $400,000 in, in graduate scholarships over the last seven years. That's a program the board feels quite strongly about and I know that will continue into the future. Uh, last year we just struck an arrangement also with uh, the Nuffield program, Nuffield Canada, and have started uh, providing some funding for that also because uh, of some of the applied research that it allows farmers to do and then bring, bring what they find back to Western Canada. I'm going to move now into the transition part of my presentation of what the next four years will look like for WGRF. Uh, and a, a primary driver uh, in this is uh, July 31st of this year, uh, what's called the Western Canadian Deduction. That was a five-year temporary checkoff when the Canadian Wheat Board uh, lost its uh, regulatory powers. Uh, the federal government put a five-year uh, temporary checkoff on wheat and barley in place so that uh, the research checkoff that we received and the, also the funding that went to SIGI in Winnipeg and the Malt Barley Technical Center would be able to continue uh, while the Western Canadian Wheat and Barley Commissions uh, got up to speed and were ready to assume responsibility. So uh, that five years is just uh, ending, as I said, in 2017. Uh, the Wheat and Barley Commissions are going to assume this responsibility, so it was important for us to put a plan in place so that there's a seamless transition. Uh, variety development research is long term. Any breaks in that uh, really hurts you in the long term. It's important to have it long term commitments and predictability to, in order to keep the new varieties coming out. So another part, what we did last summer at our board planning is, is we looked at where we could provide leadership in the future uh, moving forward and uh, really we looked at three things. Right now uh, we are recognized as a collaborator and a significant funder of research in Western Canada. We have a unique membership base that is uh, diverse from an organizational perspective, multi-crop Western Canadian and we have $130 million in the endowment fund. So when you look at all of those, that creates an opportunity for us to uh, make some long-term research investments moving forward. And that's what the board built a four-year plan on. So step number one is to make sure there's a smooth transition in wheat and barley variety development. So what we did in 2016, because we had uh, reserves in the wheat and barley funds and we had enough reserves to, to carry forward for five years of funding, uh, in 2016, we renewed the core agreements that we have. So those are with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, Universities of Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. So we put all of those in place up till 2020 and uh, committed to working with the Wheat and Barley Commissions to transition. So we would expect in about 2018, those commissions will get, uh, it takes about two years to renew those agreements. They'll start renewing those agreements, seamless transition. Uh, on the commercial side of things and on the farm, uh, it'll be a success if you don't notice anything, really. I mean, that's what it's all about, is to continue that flow of new and better varieties coming out. Where we want to increase our efforts, so is what, uh, I, just for simplicity, calling it multi-crop research, we, we can generate about $7.5 million out of that endowment fund a year and still keep it as an endowment fund without sinking it to zero over time. Uh, so. 
what our plan is is uh, to transition from the crop specific research that we're supporting on some of the larger acreage crops now into multi-crop research in the larger acreage crops and I'll explain this graphically in a second and also to continue to fund smaller acreage crops so why are we doing this uh, some of the cross-cutting issues that I think we're all starting to recognize with respect to resilience in the system adaptation to climate change nutrient cycling whether it's whether it's water quality uh, changes in pests uh, there's an, a number of issues I think you could probably have experienced yourselves or aware of or could think of. Uh, we're, we're situated because of our Western Canadian multi-crop nature to play a leadership role in those. And we're actually looking at a proposal for the next policy framework to fund some of this and to leverage these funds. Uh, we also recognize that uh, some of the smaller acreage crops are not really able to stand on their own and and don't always have the ability to leverage the public funds that are out there and to maintain diversity in our system you know for the long term for rotations we think it's important that there's still choices out there in some of the smaller acreage crops um, the large acreage crops and the commissions are very well established and provide a lot of leadership for their crops and they're in a they're in a good position to to leverage and, and find that funding but uh, we think on the multi-crop side, that's where we can really play a role in working with the larger acreage crops. That's some of the rationale behind it. Uh, one of the examples is agronomy capacity. About three years ago, uh, we, uh, we commissioned a study. We were getting quite a bit of feedback uh, from various people in the industry that there just weren't the ag agronomy researchers out there anymore, even for, to attract for project funding. and. Uh, we uh, the study did confirm that it really struck a chord with agriculture and agri-food Canada and I I should really credit George Clayton um, who's retired now he was on our research committee at the time and he was really the driver saying you know you guys need to do something you have an opportunity we've got a lot of retirements coming positions aren't being filled and uh, over the last year um, we, we've really seen a change in Ag, Ag Canada. We hope it will continue this year, but they've started filling a number of positions, you may be aware, at some of their centers in, in Lethbridge, for example, uh, Lacombe, Swift Current, I know Saskatoon. We see the, that as a real positive signal moving forward because now it'll allow us and others to do some project and program funding with those new scientists. So that is one example. Uh, graphically, um, this pie chart is uh, of our endowment fund commitments out to 2021 right now. Um, that represents about $10.7 million is the total value of that. Uh, the blue is the funding right now committed to projects that are specific for barley, canola, lentil, pea and wheat if you're not able to read that here. The red part of that is what we would call multi-crop projects that are primarily targeted to those large acreage crops. That would include the pest monitoring network for example. Um, looking at herbicide tolerant weeds, things that uh, affect a number of crops. That green uh, part of the chart is funding uh, going to crops such as, I've just listed some of them, canary seed corn, fava bean, flax, mustard, oat, rye, soy, and sunflower. And that's little small slices funding commitments we've made to bean, chickpea, forage, um, hemp, and potato. Uh, over the next four years where those arrows are is where we'll be concentrating our efforts to increase our investments. So that will be in the uh, multi-crop area that's primarily targeted at the large acreage crops as well as some of the small to medium acreage crops that really uh, at times aren't able to leverage uh, the funds that they, they need under Growing Forward and other programs to be able to, to move forward. So we see a role that we can play in working with them there. Um, this is the new website we just launched a couple weeks ago that I mentioned and so there is uh, a search engine now where you can search by keywords by institution and and it has 250 projects on this is what's active right now uh, we our next project will be to get the the remaining uh, 245 on that are historical in here so that there's a bit of a complete search and I think any of you involved in this realize there's some uh, a lot of compartmentalized knowledge and gaps in knowledge so we're trying to do what we can uh, we're not uh, and we don't have capacity or experts to do technology transfer ourselves but we try and fund events like soils and crops workshops and others 
almost that train the trainer approach. So if agrologists have the information, we count on people like you to assimilate that and get that out to your customers. So uh, it's an area we uh, have an interest in, in uh, looking at closer, so I certainly would appreciate any ideas or advice you have in that regard. Uh, so in summary, just to close, uh, we're all about producers investing in crop research to benefit Western Canadian farmers. Uh, we're multi-scope, uh, both in the, in the types of research we, f we fund and the crops that we fund. And we're really over the next four years is a, is a major transition for us as we move out of wheat and barley variety development and looking at what we can do with that endowment fund over the future.